think we'll make a start. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. No? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, brilliant. So we're doing a, a bit of a switch up now. So we've just discussed speeding at scale, you know, what can we do by 2030? And now we're transitioning all the way to the role of banks uh, and the guiding principles that really lead uh, net zero banking. And on the panel is actually a, a good success story from, from Tech Nation, who I work for, with George Sanderlands, who used to work for a company called Spherix, uh, a startup uh, in the world of carbon accounting. And they were acquired by Sage, the accountancy, pla accountancy platform, which is now called Sage Earth. So good to see George on the panel. Um, <laughs> and. And I'll hand over really straight away, actually, to, to James Vaccaro, the CEO of, of Repattern, to really get going on the world of banking and net zero. So, James, I'll hand it straight over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. It's, it's a bit nerve-wracking. It feels a bit like the beginning of the, the Doctor Who and the Cybermen looking out in front of me. Um, um, Sammy, before introducing, said, is this about banking, or is it about banking on net zero? Is it about the banks, or is it about... And actually, that might be an interesting starting point in terms of what are we banking on? What are our banks banking on? Uh, what is the role of banks in net zero? If you don't think that banks are necessary for net zero, then you may be in the wrong bit here. Um, and or we're really interested to know how that's going for you. Um, my name is James Vaccaro. Um, uh, I'm re but I'm also chief catalyst of something called Climate Safe Lending Network. Um, I, was, I was a banker in sustainable finance for 21 years. I'm now involved in, in more systems change work um, and looking at how we catalyze the banking sector and lenders, um, both from within and from multitude of stakeholders. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel in, in just a moment. I just want to give a little bit of, of framing. Um, imagine the bumper sticker for banking right now, um, like, how's my transition? Um, I wonder how, if, how many people are from banks? Here, it's like just checking the side. Oh, great, we've got quite a few. So we'll be, asked, we'll be checking in on sort of how you think things are going. Um, I, can certainly, um, I can certainly see that, that from my own experience in, in helping set up UN Principles Responsible Banking, I mean banking for a long time, that things have moved at a high level quite a lot. And whenever looking at the details, one has to look quite hard to, to sort of see, well, what is really going on? What are the things which need to happen? Where are the gaps? So we're going to be listening in on some of the, the perspectives, um, recognizing it's not as interactive and there's the Slido to place uh, questions today. Um, but we do recognize that there are still gaps. There are still things which need to be done. Good news for a conference called Innovation Zero because it means that there are still areas which we need maybe new, fresh approaches. What is it that can help uncover those? What are the, the remaining challenges? Um, and we're hearing, we've seen reports only just out that despite all the progress, all those banks who have made a lot of commitments and set targets and have joined alliances, it's not necessarily adding up to the outcomes on climate that we need. So there is still a gap. It's still better than we were before. We made a lot of progress. People are working hard. But what is it then that is still still remaining to do? Um, last bit from me, I just wanted to share a few things because we've been working and, and in fact quite a few people on this panel were involved in a project that Climate Safe Lending Network has run called the Climate Finance Catalyst Contest, where we said, well, what are the ideas which could be out there which lenders could scale to actually tr like accelerate the transition? Um, so what is it that could help banks go faster for their existing clients, go further in terms of accessing new climate solutions and go fairer in terms of embedding social justice. And we were bowled over by hundreds uh, amazing ideas, many of which are not from banks, but are very relevant to banks. Um, we had uh, people who were aggregating um, uh, energy loans, we had, we had innovations which were solving the principal agent um, dilemmas uh, for property owners uh, and their tenants in terms of investing in retrofit. Um, we had supply chain sustainability platforms which were enabling head corporates to be able to support finance flows into their suppliers with the transition. Uh, we had people using the carbon markets in innovative ways to, to look at the affordability for certain interventions, like how, how can low-income families afford things like heat pumps? Um, 
We had interesting blended finance solutions, um, integrating education. We had platforms for project finance, which can make things much more standardized, um, not just all the heavy burden of, of paper processes. Um, using AI to deliver insights um, and being able to cut out some of the intermediaries, which takes out about 90% of the value in carbon credits in, in, uh, in certain continents. So a wealth of different things that are out there in terms of ideas and innovation. But to have an impact, it's not just about ideas. It needs ideas and the implementation from those within the banks to be able to have uh, the impact. It needs to be able to fit those ideas and innovations into context, locally, um, within a country context, within a sector uh, context. And it means that a lot of maybe some unlearning. So banks have become really good at becoming efficient in known processes. But the transition is mostly unknown. We don't know what's going to work yet. So we're having to unravel a lot of those things which we're good at and efficient at to be able to become effective change makers to be able to, to accelerate the transition. So today, with the panel, we're going to be asking what's working well, what ideas are going to be really needed uh, to be implemented properly to make a difference, and what are these, those innovations which are going to make the most difference. Um, and feel free on Slido to put in comments as well. I'm just going to read this out uh, so you never know. It might, just, uh, it might be just something interesting and we can, we can share that in the room. I'm going to introduce um, the panel now uh, and I'm going to ask uh, each of them to introduce themselves in a couple of sentences. Um, one just in terms of what, they're, what you're focused on right now, the one sort of main thing in this topic related to banking on net zero. And one which is what marks out of 10 would you give for how well is banking doing in terms of the net zero transition and what is the rationale for giving your score out of 10. So uh, I'm going to introduce, so David Carlin from UNEP FI, Tony Greenham from the British Business Bank, Heather Buchanan from Bankers of Net Zero, and George Sanderlands from Sage. Um, and in turn, a sentence on what it is you're doing and your marks out of 10 rationale on how the banking on net zero transition is going right now. Great, Th thanks James, and great to be here. Thanks for tuning into our silent disco. I I know you have lots of, uh, lots of different songs you could be listening to, so appreciate that, that you're here with us. I really work on looking at scenarios and pathways to net zero, helping clients, helping our member organizations understand what those pathways are, appreciate some of the trade-offs. And I would say the banking industry right now is, to me, probably scoring about a, say, a 5.5 a out of 10. And I think that uh, there's a lot of progress in terms of the commitments, we're sort of past that stage now. We have the transition planning, which I think is a critical next step. But what we really need to do is I think we've gone as far as we can with what we say, and now the, the rest of this race needs to be run in what we do. And so, you know, if you if you want to move up from that, that kind of scraping the, uh, you know, the pass-fail grade, uh, that, that's I think what's critical. Right, all about the doing. Thanks, David. Tony. Yeah, hi everyone. So uh, I'm the Managing Director of Sustainability at the British Business Bank and what we're, well, what I'm really focused on at the moment is how we can work with our 200 plus delivery partner financial institutions to innovate our products and services to support them better to finance the, a transition to net zero. Um, and we'll talk more about that a bit, a bit in a bit, I think. Um, yeah, I'm loving Davis five and a half. I was going to go for five out of ten. Um, I, I mean now, and that's not. I don't think that's harsh because I think I'm recognising that if you were going to roll back a few years, we'd be at one, right? So progress is rapid and impressive, but we can't pretend that we're more than halfway there, right? That's why. I'm, that's why I've clumped for five. New choices there. Hi, um, Heather Buchanan. I'm chief executive and co-founder of a not-for-profit initiative called Bankers for Net Zero. We kind of do what it says on the tin to a certain extent, but we convene the UK country chapter of the Net Zero Banking Alliance. So we look very specifically. Um, there's a great deal of work going on internationally in terms of measurements and reporting and all that fun stuff. We look at the, the line in the commitments where banks have committed to decarbonizing their financed emissions by 2050. It sounds like a you know simple enough line when stated, but ultimately, it means that banks are on the hook for every single mortgage, every 
secured loan, every business loan, every corporate loan in the corporate supply chain in terms of understanding them and in there. So the, the, poly, the, the, the system is going to require an extraordinary amount of interaction between the real economy and the bank customers and the banks. And I think most people don't realize that's coming down the line. So we really look around the policy and the regulation within the UK and say, where, where are the blockers to that? And then what are the enablers? Um, uh, again, I'm probably fairly middle of, uh, middle of the road on the, on the scoring. Yeah. I'll, go, I'll be more, because I'm, I'm a pathological optimist. So I'll, I'll, get, I'll go for a 5.75, just, to, <laughs> just to, so we don't quite hit the, the sixth element there. Um, and I think that is recognizing, I mean, the discussions that we are having now, I mean, in COP26 was an absolute game changer in terms of how, how the, the private sector in general is really kind of engaging with this. And when I look at the conversations we were having just a few years ago, compared to where we are now, the progress has been extraordinary. I think that the big thing, and now we do need to get into the doing. I think the interesting thing about this is, particularly in the financial services sector, which is process driven and regulated, and you know, you've got institutions larger than some countries, and having, and we're fundamentally redefining value and redefining risk, which is at the heart of all these business models. So how that transition happens, bearing in mind, A, we just need to do things, but a lot of the way that we measure things and our safety parameters and all the rest of it aren't recognizable. And so I think there's an inherent tension in the system that we need to look at. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is George Sandilands. I'm the vice president of uh, Carbon Accounting at Sage. Uh, Sammy gave a, a prior introduction, but previously ran a, a startup, built a, uh, a carbon accounting business. Uh, we've now we've now transitioned to Sage Earth uh, as a part of Sage. Sage has two million customers globally, so we're looking to kind of scale up carbon accounting embedded into existing finance, HR, payroll uh, suites, as well as a sort of standalone software uh, for carbon accounting with about 7,000 users uh, in the UK. Um, I guess I, I, I'm also a bit of an optimist, but I might go negative because I think we're miles off achieving um, the transition that we need by 2030 in the short term. Um, and there's loads of capital that's locked up um, that can't be deployed because of data gaps. So for us, we're trying to both help more small businesses to actually measure their emissions now. Uh, we're still only about you know less than 10%, and in the you know in other parts of the world, it's it's much less than that. Um, and then also enable access to data aggreg aggregate data which can be trusted. So using existing financial data and other data points to try and build proxies which actually make sense um, that aren't sort of you know nonsense in nonsense out uh, so yeah that's that's what we're focused on and, and I'd say yeah three out of ten three out of ten yeah okay so unscientifically and unmathematically the average is about probably around four and a half um, so audience uh, if you think higher or lower so if you think it's higher than four and a half can you put your hand up, please? If you think it is lower can you, than four and a half out of 10, can you put your hand up, please? And that is quite a lot of people. And if you think it is exactly four and a half, put your hand up or just... Right, all right. Um, and if, you, if there's a Slido what, QR think all the clever gizmo sort of stuff then if you want to put any comments into slido on what score you think it is and why you can do that as we as we go into the discussion um, interesting range of perspectives in terms of what is needed because there's and there's different there's different things which we'll kind of uh, unpack maybe tony if it's all right to start with you british business banks got quite uh, i mean a sort of a real overview in terms of the whole market in terms of smes also the lenders who are, and, and other investors, all different types of finance providers uh, into SME. You've talked about these three different ways that SMEs can actually contribute towards net zero, either innovating themselves or helping others, enabling, or just adopting some of the, the cool stuff which is gonna downstairs. Um, maybe can you say a little bit more about that that framework and what you see as the priorities for lenders and finances in those three strategies for, for businesses yeah thanks James so I mean I'm pleased we're having 
this conversation about banking at this event actually because uh, it helps to illustrate how we need to join up some dots in terms of helping the UK's SMEs to transition to net zero. So the British Business Bank, as James suggested, and hopefully many of you know, we, we span a broad range of finance from being the UK's largest limited partner investor in venture capital uh, to also um, providing wholesale finance and guarantees uh, to banks and credit providers. So, you know, we span the whole range there. And I think what's important about that is that when we look at the whole universe of five and, five and a half, roughly, SMEs in the UK, um, it is absolutely vital that the exciting startups and growth companies get the capital they need. And we certainly are fully committed into that. We've, um, in the last year we published accounts for, we, we put over 420 million into clean tech. I can't, I'm not at liberty to, uh, uh, to report the latest number because the accounts aren't out yet. And, um, and that's not actually counting that through some of our other funds that are focused on regional growth throughout the country, we know that we're also funding uh, you know, other environmentally focused and uh, socially um, impactful startups. So there's a broad range already out there. But I think that that role of, of innovation is crucial, but it's, it's only going to get us there if we also have small businesses that are there to help deploy those innovations into the whole of that, you know, whole of the economy, basically, from tip to toe, and the SMEs themselves adopt those innovations rapidly. And for that, it's quite likely that they will need debt-based finance, uh, whether that be from a mainstream bank, challenger bank, or asset finance provider. And so, really, I guess what I'm saying is that if we don't have the right form uh, and appropriate types and affordable finance for all parts of that journey through innovating, you know, the adoption and uh, in those, those companies that actually deploy these new innovations into the economy, then we're not going to get there. So what we see down on the floor today is, is super important. But we also need to remember what's outside there in all the millions of small businesses that all need to adopt, whether that... And there's, in a way, it boils down to, you know, wheels, bricks, and kit, right? I mean, they need to, it's hardware quite often. <laughs> Software can help them do that, but they also need to change their hardware. So a broad range of finance that's, that's required across the piece, and we need to make it all join up. So that makes sense instinctively. So there's these gaps, uh, and it needs to be comprehensive. Are those gaps, do you think, visible to the finance players themselves? Or what is it that's stopping them moving into this gap? Are they not seeing it as an opportunity or are they just too difficult? What's the... Well, I think that um, yeah, one, of the, one of the problems, one of the challenges we have here is that you know, uh, credit providers have very sophisticated models, um, but they're all based on yesterday's economy, right? It's backward looking data. Uh, it's models and data that is not of the economy we're trying to finance. And that's, that's a problem, you know, this is a, a challenge that banks have to face. So this introduced new, new types of risk and uncertainty into how they can price, price debt. And I think in a way, that's what institutions like the British Business Bank, backed by the government, are able to, you know, try and provide the solutions that just, just close those gaps to help un unlock more finance. That's, that's where our role, I think, is, is very productive, hopefully. Yeah. And if there was something which, you know, you were to wake up tomorrow morning and sort of you hear something on the radio over breakfast about something being announced that a finance provider has been doing or some, something which could kind of really shake this up, what, what, might that, what might that look like? What do you think is the biggest, sort of the sharpest point of the need right now? Well, I mean, this is, this is me going to swim right outside my lane here, but I mean, I, th I think there's something, um, I wonder whether central banks have more agents here, here to reflect the sort of societal risks of climate change through the way they regulate banks and their capital. So different risk weightings is, guess what I'm pointing out there. Right. Um, to help, so, to, well, that would definitely feed through into the way that banks can then price risk and weight, you know, tilt tilt the incentives towards finance for green and transition and sustainable finance and away from uh, brown. Um, but also, I think, must have got to remember, I mean, I can't help but say that the financial economy is also interlocked with the, with the real economy. And, and what I'd also love to hear is, you know, more repricing of actual markets, carbon taxes, whatever it is. But we've got to get the pricing right in the actual markets before banks almost can really supply the right finance into that economic activity, right? Super, thank you. Anyone from Bank of England or PRA here today? Or we can see you around the back later. Um, um, maybe turning to David, because in, in terms of the whole frameworks, in terms of the regulatory kind of side, um, 
sustainable finance has seemed to kind of, it's, moved, it's evolved from what started out as like, can we actually know where we're aiming and then, then getting to the measurement, set up, setting targets. We've now just had a lot of transition planning, especially the transition plan task force here in the UK. Um, and now we're just starting to define, to design and mobilize transition finance. Can you say a little bit around what does that really mean? Because in some ways you could say, well, anything which is going broadly in the right direction uh, is like ticks the box. But we, what we know and what we've kind of heard in that calibration of our somewhere around four and a half out of 10, or maybe to the audience lower than that, is that it's not going far or fast enough. So, so what does transition finance really need to mean to make a difference? Yeah, so I, I think that this is kind of the critical question and there have been frameworks that have been effectively developed, um, whether through the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, um, through others thinking about how do we define these things. But I, I think at a fundamental level, we, we really need to grapple with the fact that one, there is a transition underway globally. Um, it is happening in the markets. It's happening with policy action. It's happening due to technology. Now, I think we need to lay that aside for a second and say, however, that transition is not going fast enough or far enough for what we scientifically need. And so what this starts to look like when you lay it out like that is actually a lot like reforestation or offsets in the sense that what we really start to care about is this idea of additionality, this question of, what is outside of the traditional market activity that is going above and beyond? It's great to say you're doing all of this transition finance, but if it's simply a reclassification of things that are already on your book, it's not really impactful, at least in bending that curve further. Yes, you are riding the wave of the transition, but you are not making the wave. And so I think it's really important when we think about transition that we, we avoid what I think has been a mistake of kind of misspecifying, of saying, okay, really low carbon things are transition things. Well, yes and no, in the sense that yes, that is the target state, but really what is the delta? What is the emissions that we are aiming to reduce from this activity? And similarly, we can't also be on the other end of that spectrum saying, well, they're a company that really needs to transition and sort of throwing money in a wishful direction is also not good enough. I think we need the rigor of use of proceeds, we need the specificity of transition plans, and we need those things to really begin to say, can we quantify this money is going to drive a new low carbon alternative to the blast furnace that was in there before, or this is going to drive a shift from a internal combustion engine fleet to an EV fleet. Understanding those kind of specifics, that's actually where we get to the point of transition finance. So I really do try to bring people back to additionality and not to confuse things that are already net zero, things that are high emitting, and things that are sort of wishful thinking with what is real impact. And so if we, we make impact our goal, I think we'll begin to see transition finance comes into focus a lot more. So that's I mean, it's brilliantly articulated, and, and I think without wanting to make you blush, I mean, you do articulate this so amazingly, I think, and in terms of the world, you, your, your voice and clarity is really important, but who do banks need to be hearing that message from? What is it that's going to take not just the sustainability community and the people trying to make a change within kind of department, you know, with their customers, but, but boards, and all of the people who might potentially be either deliberately or inadvertently barriers to, to, to that change. Yeah, so th this is, of course, climate as a planetary goal. This is an all hands on deck effort. We need civil society, we need consumers. One thing that I think is a bit unfortunate that, that exists is despite the fact that we do need policy, we need consumers, we need NGOs, we need everyone pushing firms in the same direction. We're also though, really, I think, sometimes underestimating our own agency individually. And what I mean by that is, we talk about markets and the efficiency of markets and how the market decides. But truth be told, when it comes to success, when I think about firms that I've worked with on reporting, on sustainability strategy, every single one of them, I think, with no exceptions, has had a senior executive who has taken this on board as something that they want to own. So really, at the top, there is that, that tone and that ownership. And so it's getting those people and realizing they can make a difference. But some of those people are sitting in this room, but all of us are sitting in this room as consumers. And what I would say is, you have a real asymmetric influence 
on these institutions. I, I once said to someone who is an activist, you know, if you just call every day and talk to the pension plan and say, hey, we want a fossil free option, that is going to be shocking to them. The number of calls that they are getting about what the offerings are is so minimal that that is like blaring noise, like the background noise we, we have in these headphones. And, and similarly, I said, if you're upset with how your bank is doing, your retail bank, if you and a bunch of friends you know, go into Hyde Park and you cut up your credit cards from that same institution, they, I guarantee their board will be meeting on the weekend to figure this out. So just individually, we have a ton of power as people, but I think also organizationally within these places, this is a human question as well. We can always talk about the big systemic forces, and we absolutely should. But I, I think sometimes we, we abdicate our own agency, and I think it's, it's really an unfortunate thing when we do that. That's brilliant. I'd like you to do a practice now of your own agency. Um, on Slido, you can upvote the questions. Um, unfortunately, the questions which are on this panel are actually for the whole of today rather than just this. So if you go back over the last half an hour and upvote the questions that you'd like to answer. Um, one of the questions was, why are all the good questions being moderated out of the stack? It's because the moderators can't see very well. Um, and it could really help me uh, if, we can, if we can practice some of that agency to get the, the most relevant questions when we go to the Q&A at the end. Thank you, um, David. I, I'm going to also just build on that in terms of influencing. Heather, I mean, Bankers for Net Zero is doing some amazing things, but your, your career has been in Parliament and being able to bring perspectives from bankers into parliamentarians and from parliamentarians into bankers, probably in, in, in equal measure. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit around what, what are the new conversations which are, which are required to be able to kind of further this? What we've, what we've seen is that when a crisis hits, like COVID, bankers were pretty clear in terms of what was required, and it was just like emergency assistance now. We're recognizing that there's some of these systemic ideas like the one that Tony spelled out, all of these kind of things which are being circulated in conferences, myriad conferences, but what is it which would actually tip the balance to be able to get something through a parliamentary process? Um, yes, yeah, so significant challenges, and I, always, I often say to the banks that we work with, because they uh, uh, the green finance in, in particular, mortgages, the number of ministers and politicians that I've had come to me and say, we just tell the banks to sort out more green mortgages so we can deal with the retrofit thing, which of course isn't going to do it at all because it needs significant policy intervention. And then of course the banks come to us and say, well, why aren't they kind of being more ambitious and doing things? And I always say to the banks, you know, you've got your own risk profiles. You can, you know, fortunately for you, you can kind of model it out on an algorithm and a an Excel spreadsheet, politicians kind of have that same risk profile that they have to, to go through, um, albeit ever so slightly less rational, one could, one could argue. So a lot of this is how do you de-risk the bigger policy making decisions? And I think a lot of this really is, and let's face it, lobbying's got a, is a dirty word for a lot of people and quite, that's got quite negative connotations. So. What we did with Bankers for Net Zero is saying, well, we're not just banks in the room, we're getting businesses in the room, we're getting academia in the room, we're getting civil society in the room, so we can be a kind of neutral convener. And this was, you know, five years ago when a lot of, a lot of those, you know, NGOs and banks wouldn't have been comfortable kind of inviting the other over for tea, if you know what I mean, but kind of bringing them in, in the middle. And then engaging with policy, and, and I, I think that we do actually have to fundamentally, again, change a bit of this, you know, the government goes into a back room, does a consultation, sends something out, and there's, there's more of a pact that needs to come out of this. And, and as long as we're transparent about the conversations that, are, that, that we're having in there, you know, it's kind of reaching that common goal. When I often joke that my job is really, we, I mean, we don't think of anything new. I mean, people have, you know, most of the stuff's out there. It's just generally about kind of reframing it, you know, for depending on who you're speaking to and to what, depending on what political party you're speaking to and all the rest of it. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of this is just um, herding cats and connecting dots. <laughs> and, and what we've learned recently is so, so if you take, for example, you know, where we are behind in the UK context, so things like heat pumps, probably about still 40 to 50,000 a year. We said we we're going to be 600,000 a year in only a few years from now. 
there's all these big gaps. But what we realise and we've learned in the last year is that what really shifts politicians are powerful, emotional ITV dramas. Yes. So if there was to be one right now, which, which encapsulates some of the banking challenges, what would it be, what would it be on? Oh, that's, that's a cruel question. It is. Um, <laughs> so um, and so I, I guess what, what are we talking about? Is it through, through the eyes of the banks? Because they, they certainly have, um, you know, the, the frustration, I guess, with the policy. And you probably, you'd probably actually find yourself in, in a maze, kind of forever going through and finding dead ends and not being able to see where you're going um, in, in terms of the policy side of things. But I do think that we have to put some responsibility on, on the politicians in this, in this sense as well. Because it's not easy to, to kind of go between the whole, this is something that requires a great deal of investment. Um, and lots of people don't have the money and businesses don't want to take on the debt and all the, the issues around that. And this is where the British Business Bank comes in um, so strongly just to be able to kind of help bridge some of those gaps. Um, but yeah, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure you can, you can about help. that. I'll, I'll have to think yeah, about that. I'll, yeah. I'll ask for help from the panel. Well, I'm not well, that clever. May <laughs> well, maybe. I mean, it might come from. I mean, there's the top line kind of stuff. But actually, as maybe George, you you've sort of indicated, some of the movement might come from some of these more granular insights in the data. And I wondered if you might be able to talk around sort of how. What's I mean? There's we're swimming in a sea of data. But what is it that turns it into insights which can really drive the behaviours at the scale and pace that we need? Um, maybe you can talk to, to a few examples or what are the kind of the key principles which are going to actually bring clarity rather than just more figures to wade through? Sure. Um, so we're all about small businesses, um, really focused on how small businesses can decarbonise what role they play in scope three emissions, how every business is in every other business's value chain. Uh, every business need, you know, is, a, is a source of primary data in principle. Um, one of the biggest problems that we've got at the minute on the, on the data front, CDP, the kind of uh, carbon disclosure project, globally kind of agreed framework for corporate um, emissions disclosures, is there's an awful lot of nonsense in it, and that's not their fault. 20% of the submissions are blank in lots of places. There is, uh, you know, boundaries are put in different places, um, different methodologies are deployed. There is zero consistency between one corporate's um, reporting and another. And that's the best that we've got, yeah. let alone the um, data that's available for the 99% of businesses on the planet that are small and 50 plus um, you know, of um, global kind of turnover. 50% of global turnover. Yeah, so I, I mean, we've got a huge problem because a, a lot of all these underlying bank risk matrices are based on data which is not trustworthy, not auditable, not, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of kind of assurance companies going out there and giving it a nice little stamp saying, yes, this looks like you've done what you've said you've done. Um, but it doesn't really help in a, in a network where we actually all need to work together on the challenge of moving towards net zero. So, you know, one thing that we're trying to do, not in a silo, I think is really important as well. We are very collaborative and, and would, would, would say anyone who wants to get involved in what we're up to or in a sort of co-creation around data schemas and working together on this, there's a huge challenge and we all need to work together as an industry. Um, but, but yeah, moreover, it's, um, yeah, the, the thing that we're really trying to do is bring what you know, useful data together for the stakeholders that need it to make decisions. Yeah. And George, something around data, I mean, people have said for decades, it's like, oh, well, it's not the data. And one of the reposts that I've developed is, well, what is it you're asking for and what is it you would do with it if you were to have it? So being able to actually train the data users on the querying process and the activation process. How, how well evolved or who do you see as kind of as being the most evolved in that kind of aspect to be able to kind of work on those those issues? I think it's quite good. I'm sat next to Heather. I mean, one of the great initiatives that Bankers for Net Zero are doing is the Perseus project, which is all about automating scope two emissions. Uh, so we're a, we're a sponsor and a very big supporter of, of this, this project. And it's all about how can we get the utility companies to actually open up the access to the data so that any stakeholder can need it in a in a sort of peer-to-peer -peer trusted network. You know, yeah. there's 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 a bunch of schemes going on like that, but I think that's a great example of ways that actually it's 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 
it's private and it's public working together in, in a way to open up data flows. Um, and you know, the, the, the team, uh, Gavin Starks, who works with Heather on this, was one of the sort of co-creators around the open banking standard. So that, that's for us the kind of principles that we need in, in data is opening up access to it and making, making it simple and accessible for the stakeholders who need it. Great, super, one to look up on Bankers for Net Zero. Um, I'm going to read out some questions, bear with me because I can't see very well. Um, there's going to be three questions and each one person is going to take one of them and I don't know who that's going to be yet. Um, so, uh, firstly, how can banks leverage capital to support biodiversity and conservation? What's the current approach and what needs to change? So something around nature. Um, second one, banks are also very nervous about the risks of inadvertent greenwashing with linking funding to sustainability. This is a blocker for transition finance. I suppose the implied question is, so what do we do about that? Uh, and this green hushing concept. Um, and thirdly, we saw governments globally deploy guarantee type products during COVID, plenty of them. Is the British Business Bank, or maybe others, uh, considering this for the climate emergency to support banks to lend more? So nature, greenwashing, sort of helicopter money, sort of support support packages. Who'd like to pick up nature and biodiversity? What's needed there? Partly looking at David. Yeah, so as, as UNEPFI recently launched our risk center, bringing together climate, nature, and other environmental risks, we, we very much recognize that institutions need to be dealing with these in a systemic way. And, and part of that means also financing them in a systemic way. The really great thing is that something like 35% of our emissions reductions, of our abatement of harms, can come from nature-based solutions when it comes to climate. And so looking at these things where we get a dual benefit, ones also that then support indigenous rights, sometimes a triple benefit, but realizing that these are the kinds of things that we need so we don't solve each problem by creating another one, but really take this holistic view. I think I sometimes call this the ecosystems view, which is, you can't really evaluate an action or a decision individually. You need to think of it in the context. How does it fit? Just like a predator, just like a primary producer, just like any part of that ecosystem, how it fits together and becomes greater than the sum of its parts. So I think when it comes to bank financing, my biggest hope for nature is to make nature financing boring. I was joking about that, but, but I, I'm serious when I say it needs to be scalable in the way that retail mortgages are. It needs to be commoditizable, it needs to be something that is able to be brought about in the markets that need it the most. In many cases, those are emerging markets, those are ones where capital markets aren't so developed. And so institutions that have learned these lessons from climate change, I think they are actually in very good position to apply some of the lessons. People say, oh, but nature is so different, it's so much bigger. And the answer is yes, but the governance structure, the strategy, a lot of these things are going to still be lessons learned, and if you take that ecosystems-based approach, I think you'll see where those opportunities lie. And to me, this is one of the areas of just massive market failure and inefficiency. Somebody who's gonna get there first and realize that not only are these things good investments, but the level of risk associated with them, especially as we move toward this more sustainable world, is a lot less than they're being priced at. And, and I think somebody's gonna really be very successful if they are able to, to crack that. But to me, that's really where nature fits in, is it needs to be considered in every climate decision, but it also needs its own additional financing to meet the goals to get to nature positive by 2030. Thank you, David. Uh, greenwashing, so everybody's kind of got the microphone in front of banks saying, what are you doing? But then if it doesn't actually feel like it's good enough, then it sort of, it looks like greenwashing. So what is it we do about it to unlock? Well, I mean, I think that we're kind of in the process of, and I think transition plans have a huge role to play within this and having a lot more kind of transparency around what is a transition plan, what is a good transition plan, let's face it, the, a level of socialization of what transition plans are and what those mean. Um, because, oh, you know, it, it's all fine and dandy to kind of go and glue yourself to, to, the, to the front of an institution and say, you know, get out of this now. Of course, the risk being if they got out now, it could go to the shadow banking sector where, you know, you can take you can take carbon off your balance sheet, uh, an institution's balance sheet, you can't take it off the Earth's balance sheet. So I think that there's there's a level of uh, having a much more honest and open conversation, particularly with the public, around what the challenges are around this, what transition planning actually means, 
in terms of that investment and then holding people to, you know, institutions to account on those plans, but having a lot more recognition that this is a, an incredibly, incredibly complex area where we've got a lot of competing regulation, competing interests, competing everything else and saying, okay, this is where we need to get to, let's track it through. And I think until transitions really become part, it still seems like a bit of a black box for a lot of people. So, and, you know, and of course bring in, we need good data, but that we can't let data be the blocker for it. Yeah. And then finally on support packages, I mean, let's not speculate in terms of the business bank, British Business Bank necessarily being the provider of it, but let's just say a future government of whichever variety said, here's 10 billion quid for the UK, and we're going to do something innovative involving banks somehow. What kind of form of support would actually make the most difference? What kind of construction right now could be, could be the, the sort of the, the policy with the most impact? Well, I'm, I don't mind sort of trying to yeah. answer the original question okay, a bit more sure. closely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, yeah. I mean, with the important disclaimer that, um, that we deliver government policy as an institution, we don't make government policy. But, um, but I'd just like to distinguish between the physical risks of climate change, of which global pandemics is one. Yeah. So, you know, if you think that the COVID was the last one we're going to get, probably think again. Um, a physical risk of climate change, I think what the COVID response shows you is that um, there is institutional capacity to respond uh, if, if there are areas of the economy, areas of society that are hit uh, badly and that threatens uh, livelihoods and that, that threatens, you know, th then, then we have tools at our disposal. And I suppose that's a comforting yeah. thought. I mean, the British Business Bank sort of, it, it, the total money we deployed uh, into the economy went up by a f um, uh, you know, an order of magnitude, and the, the, as an institution, we doubled in size in 18 months in order to be able to deliver that. What was the total for COVID? Heather, you probably it's know. 80 billion. Of 80 billion, account. yeah. So, um, but in terms of transition, I'm not sure that that's, I'm not sure it's a useful analogy. I mean, that was, a, and we've always been used to uh, act counter cyclically, counter cyclically, so we lean in, in more when, there are, when the economy is challenged. So, so I think. I think there are lessons there about responding to, to the physical impacts of climate change. In terms of how you finance transition, the COVID schemes isn't, I don't think, is, is a useful model. I mean, that was a generalized yeah. semi-bailout. I mean, yeah. in, in, whereas transition, we need to be more forensic about what needs to be financed where in the economy and with what kind of money. Yeah, but it could be that it's a, it's a, it's a quantum of cash to kickstart something, and then, it, as you say, a forensic analysis, maybe with some data yeah, I mean, insights. Well, I, I mean, I, I'd make a suggestion, and you know, it's not a it's not a financial instrument, but maybe more of a policy one. Um, a zero VAT rate on retrofit would be a very good way of stimulating that whole ecosystem. You know, it, if uh, if builders are struggling, you know, big builders are knocking things down and starting again because it's a twenty percent. You know. Right, that, 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 to me, from the outside looking in, seems like quite a simple one, if there was some cash lying around. Excellent, super. I think we're going to probably be rounding up, so going to be challenging for some of the things that you think would be the changes which would make the biggest difference. So I think that that, that feels like a pretty solid um, policy. It could, be, it could be a piece of government policy, it could be a data insight, it could be something banks could be doing, it could be something in the relationship. But in this space on banking on net zero, what thing gives you most hope or what would be most promise in terms of being able to make the most difference? Most hope. Um, so probably several areas within that, but I think I think there are some probably some, some fairly fundamental questions we should be asking and maybe looking at having a bit more clarity or giving more direction in terms of what does fiduciary duty actually mean? Um, I've certainly heard that used as, as a bit of a fig leaf for what would are arguably some poorer decisions in there. So back to, you know, rather than it being kind of interpretive other stakeholders, let's actually get really specific about what fiduciary duty actually means in terms of a board element and that will focus minds at a very at a very senior level. Um, and again, I, I think back to back to the long term um, policy making and and having a much more kind of open, transparent process for engagement across the board. Thank you. I've been given the time signal, so any quick thoughts on the, the one thing which would make the biggest difference right now? Well, I don't know, this is a bit controversial, but I'd kind of like to not hear about 2050. Um, I want to hear about 
2030, 2035. Because uh, those of you who've seen what the curve looks like, the hard work is now. It is not like five years before we get to 2050. Right. <laughs> so, so just we need to concentrate minds a bit more on the urgency of our things. Yeah, I think Tony's right. And when we ask about the 2030 world, we're living in it right now. The capital allocation decisions we're making, those are going to be where mines get built, where factories happen, where policy is made, where electorates decide. So th these are the things that are happening now. We are, we are in that 2030 world. And so we're not going to be able to turn the, the ship around in 2029. It's, it, it is right now. The thing that gives me hope, though, is positive tipping points. And we are always talking in climate about shutdowns in ocean circulations and collapse of forests. But they're also positive tipping points, and we are not always so good at spotting them. But last year, 75 plus percent of new generation capacity was coming from low carbon. So that installation means we're already installing a lot more than ever before. We installed more in 2023 in a week of low carbon energy than we did in a year about 15 years ago. And so we are really doing these things at a speed and scale where that really low base that's growing fast is going to very quickly intersect demand. And that's going to have big implications, a lot of destabilization. But those that are ready for it, I think, are going to not only come out on the other side, but really be part of a, a big transformation. Thank you. We're going to draw this to a close. There's been a lot of hopeful messages there. There's amazing amounts of intellect and commitment and ideas. There's innovations downstairs. What gives me hope is actually seeing people within banks and financial institutions now getting the bit between the teeth and recognizing this is the best time to be connecting through money into sustainability. This is the best time to be a banker. Um, want to thank all the panel. Uh, would love to meet some of you. Um, thank you to Innovation Zero. Thank you for, for listening. <laughs>